the gentleman from California, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, uh, Ms. Griffin, uh, I asked a lot of documents be placed in the record earlier, uh, and most of them are relate related to the gentleman next to you, uh, Mr. Malmuth. It's an amazing thing to me that uh, I came from a standard-setting organization, Electronics Industries Association and, and CEA, and uh, you couldn't have a high-definition television if we hadn't figured out what the standards would, were going to be. We wouldn't be arguing over capturing of digital broadcast if we didn't have digital broadcast. Standards are extremely important. But standards and laws are different. And, and I'd like to concentrate with someone on this end of the table. Uh, Mr. Malmood, I'm going to read just the shortest part of the Constitution for a moment where it says to establish post offices and post roads, post offices are next door, uh, and it says to promote progress, and I'll skip over of science and useful arts for a moment, and limited to, and, and of limited times, and I'm just going to read how it relates to copyright. To promote the progress for limited times to authors. Okay, that's it. That's the Constitution. It's only a paragraph to promote progress of science and useful arts by securing for a limited time to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. But that short one, to promote to authors. Who authors a law? And that's my point, and it's the point of all the documents I put in. If the state of Idaho, the state of Georgia, uh, the state of Mississippi, if they produce a law, every single person who voted for it is an author. It, the doesn't, it doesn't belong to some entity by definition. Isn't every law, in fact, and I, I gotta tell you, Obamacare has people who do not want to be authors and others who, a few left who do, but on the day that it passed, we were all authors. So my question, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to concentrate on this end and then open up to the rest, is in its rawest form, isn't in fact every single person who participates in the creation of a law or the inclusion by association of a standard in fact an author? And therefore, if I'm willing to have it released to, to everyone, as an owner of that copyright, an uh, undivided owner, don't you ultimately have no possibility of protection? In other words, the state of Idaho is inherently wrong if they consider any part of a law required or mandated to be, in fact, eligible for copyright. And, and my, my point here, and, and Carl, I'm going to go to you first. I've been in Congress for 13 years and about eight days. The one thing I know is I don't need a copyright to promote politicians making laws. So by definition, the promote being the basis for copyright, don't we inherently have a decision to make about whether or not laws or anything else which is included in a law by mandate has any right to a copyright at all? A fundamental, forget about what we do with this copyrighted material, is it really eligible for copyright? Um, Congressman Issa, thank you for, for that question. Um, I think that is the crux of the matter. Um, the VET court, when it looked at whether the building code of Texas had the law, said that, that there is no incentive needed for the... the Politicians the will make laws whether you... Absolutely. You just have to pay them per diem and they'll show up. And the standards bodies, I've never seen a standards body object to one of their documents becoming incorporated by law. That is often the case. I think that's especially crucial on public safety laws. Now, we may incorporate by reference too many things, and perhaps the guidance of this committee could be used. Uh, on, on that topic, but for those that are crucial, for example, the laws on testing the toxicity of water is something that every citizen in West Virginia today wants to know what those laws are and were they carried out properly. And I think that is the key point. You can't have it both ways. If the document is in fact a law, it has to be available. And I, I respect the rights of the standards bodies to develop a wide range of standards, but once one of those has become the law, 
then it needs to be available. Now, again, a standards body can say, please do not incorporate this into law. We would prefer that this document not become the law. And that is perfectly acceptable. There are multiple standards bodies. There are several fire codes, several building codes, several plumbing codes. And you will find immediately a group standing up and saying, please designate mine to be the law. And Ms. Griffin, I'm going to ask you the, the, fo the follow-up that goes along this line quickly. What, what Mr. Malmode says said is what I'm trying to make a point on. If it is a voluntary standard, in fact, it's, it's, av it's available for copyright. I understand that. But if it is incorporated in law, at that point, shouldn't you object to it being incorporated or recognize that you're waiving any copyright objections from the public having free and fair access to essentially a law that they must comply with? Thank you, Congressman. The, I think the answer is, is incorporated into OMB, the policy of OMB A119 and the NPTAA. And, and those policies and those laws dictate that uh, government agencies, federal agencies, incorporate uh, voluntary consensus standards in lieu of government unique standards whenever they are able to do so. Okay, but OMB is, is nowhere enshrined in the Constitution and it does not have explicit legislative authority. This is the committee that must decide what can or cannot be, be covered under the promote and uh, an exclusive uh, element of copyright. And the rest of the panel is extremely important, and we work on it all the time. But in a digital age, narrowly, Mr. Chairman, the law and people's access to laws which they must comply with inherently this committee has to decide whether that should be stripped of any and all copyright to the extent that we have authority, which has nothing to do with what OMB thinks, because quite frankly, they think they can make laws without Congress getting up in the morning ever again. So constitutionally, on what basis would you say that that, that has any grounding, not what OMB thinks? Well, well, let me tell you what the Second Circuit and the Ninth Ms. Circuit... Ms. Griffin, if you could be brief, as briefly as possible, time has expired. Yes, but let me tell you what the Second Circuit and the Ninth Circuit said on that very point. In the PMI case, the, the Ninth Circuit said that the due process requirement of free access to the law may be relevant, but does not justify termination of, and in this case, um, it was the American Medical Association's copyright. There's no evidence that anyone wishing to use the, the standard at issue in that case had any difficulty in obtaining it. And that was the PMI case in the Ninth Circuit. The Second Circuit, in a similar case, in CCH Info, said we are not prepared to hold that a state's reference to a copyrighted work as a legal standard for valuation results in loss of copyright. With, while there are in, indeed policy considerations that support CCC's argument, they are opposed by countervailing considerations. For example, a rule that the adoption of such a reference by a state legislator or administrative body deprived the copyright owner of its property would raise very substantial problems under the taking clause of the Constitution. Although there is, and I'm, I'm jumping to the last sentence of that paragraph, although there is scant authority for CCC's argument, uh, Professor Nimmer's treatise opposes such a suggestion as antithetical to the interest sought to be advanced by the Copyright Act. So, so at the end of the day, it is a balance. It's a balance uh, between the rights of copyright holders and, and the value that, that those copyrights bring to, to federal regulations. As I okay. said earlier. Uh, thank, thank you. And, and Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your indulgence. And I just want to go on the record that in the copyright reform that we are considering as a committee, uh, in order to have my vote on final passage, we will have to rectify the ambiguity in the law so that every American has free access to every law that he or she must live under. I thank the gentleman from California.